Did you know that the way that we are eating can be related with depression? Yeah, with depression, with anxiety, with panic attacks, with people having a lot of mental disorders. And mental disorders and mental diseases and mental conditions have been rising on the past years, like they have skyrocketed like something I have never seen in most of the physicians that we haven't seen before. And there are a lot of reasons, there are a lot of conditions that are related with this. But the way that we eat, not only nutrition, but the way that we eat, eating by itself, because, and I'm saying eating because eating is a, like nutrition, it's a small part within eating by the act, the term eating. Why? Because eating is related on the way that we eat, how we eat, when we eat, how we relate with the food, how we relate with what we're eating. How does food connect us? as a society, how it's a part of the society in which you live in, how it's connecting you with your friends, with your family, with yourself. So this is something that is really affecting us. And we, when we go and see also in terms of nutrition, it's also affecting us. So I really want to talk about you, about how nutrition, how eating is affecting us and it's affecting us in a way that it can also lead to depression. So the first thing that I've seen that it's very um, common is when you go and check, if we have the standard American diet, when you go and check that, the standard American diet, which is high in ultra processed foods, high in chemicals, high in, in seed oils, high in sugars, high in processed flours, high in a lot of things that we shouldn't be consuming in those levels and, and in that way and in that level of process, then that can lead to chronic inflammation. And the thing with chronic inflammation is that it can give us neuroinflammation. Did you, did you know that the brain has a barrier that is called the blood-brain barrier? The blood-brain barrier, its name is very descriptive because it's a barrier that separates what it comes in my blood and wants to enter my brain. But that barrier, really, it's a filter that says, yeah, come on coming in, ah, uh, you know, it's a filter. Like the one we have in your intestine that we're going to talk about in a moment. So the blood brain barrier is semi-permeable, but it's permeable to some things and to some others that cannot cross. What's the problem when we have chronic inflammation produced by all our habits, by chronic stress, by chemicals, and of course, but what we're eating, it's going to open the holes in that barrier and it's going to make it more permeable. When we have a permeable or more permeable blood brain barrier, it could lead to a lot of neurological conditions, and in this case, to depression. But also, there is something that it, in, in terms of nutrition, we know all the nutritional deficiencies. When someone has nothing of something. So it's like when you're broke. If you're broke, you have completely no money at all. But what happens when you're in a difficult situation because you have too little money? You're not broke, but you have not enough very little amount of money. That's the same thing when you have a deficiency, but an insufficiency. And we know deficiencies. We know the deficiency of, of vitamin C that causes scurvy, the deficit of vitamin B1 that call, produces something called beriberi. We know those deficiencies or those deficits, what they cause. But what happens with insufficiencies? Like the insufficiency of omega-3, the insufficiency of vitamin B6. What happens with the insufficiency of magnesium, which is very important for the brain? Well, the most important neurotransmitter for uh, brain stability and for happiness, which is called serotonin, serotonin is made from tryptophan. And if we don't have enough tryptophan, it's been related with mental conditions such as depression. But again, low folate levels are related with depression. Low omega-3, low vitamin B12, low vitamin B6 are related with mental conditions such as depression. The other thing that food or the bad eating patterns or habits or ways could lead, to, could lead us, when you mix that, if you mix stress, the use of chronic PPIs or omeprazole, insoprazole, pentoprazole, or ranitidine, or any other anti-acid medication, and if you mix that with the standard American diet, which affects the natural production of acid in your stomach, that's going to lead for an infection in your gut microbiome. When you have an affected gut microbiome, remember that again, as in the brain, the intestine needs to be semi-permeable. Semi-permeable means that it needs to be permeable to food when it's already 
process when when you have chewed when you have all the digestive enzymes when you have the microbiome helping to digest everything else it should be permeable to those molecules in a very small particle to water sodium any other electrolyte glucose it should be permeable for that but what happens when you have an altered microbiome and you expose the cells that are on that that gut lining they're going to open so when they open when they get wider all those particles all the chemicals all the different compounds are going to enter to your bloodstream that's going to cause chronic inflammation that's going to cause toxicity to your liver and that's going to alter the gut brain axis and the gut brain axis is something that we already know that it's a double way double way connection gut brain brain gut the production of neurotransmitters most of the serotonin that we produce in the body it's produced by the intestine when we alter the gut brain axis we can alter the blood brain barrier we can alter and cause chronic inflammation and it's completely linked and it has been widely described in the literature the connection in the ways in which you get low levels of serotonin because of the of the alteration in the gut barrier when you have higher intestinal permeability and how it affects or it alters the gut brain connection or the gut brain axis the other one is remember that most of the people right now they eat a lot of sugar a lot of chemicals a lot of processed flours a lot of pastry a lot of carbs and there they have a pattern in which we eat every two or three hours because someone had the brilliant idea of saying that when you're eating every three hours you're going to boost your metabolism and you're going to boost everything else so you're going to burn more really in what world what is going to happen with that is that you're going to have a lot of glucose spikes and you're going to have a lot of insulin spikes and when you have a lot, a lot of insulin spikes, then you're going to end up producing a lot of insulin in your system. And when you produce a lot of insulin and you, when you have a lot of glucose spikes, you're going to have inflammation that is going to lead to insulin resistance. When you have insulin resistance, apart from all of the other things that are going to happen, you're going to start altering the hormones in your body that regulate appetite, such as ghrelin, such as leptin, such as neuropeptide Y. Those regulate if you're hungry or not when by having insulin resistance you're going to have all these hormones being altered asking you to eat and to eat more and unfortunately when we're hungry when we're hungry at 4 p.m you're not looking for broccoli you're not looking for carrots or lettuce now you're looking for pastry you're looking for dessert you're looking for ice cream you're looking for something that is highly palatable because the industry knows it for well. So when they create these foods that are very addictive in the way that they cause this highly palatable, highly rewarding foods, all these foods that you want to keep on eating all the time. Plus, you eat them all the time and you it gives you glucose spikes, insulin spikes, you go and eat with one problem. This causes guilt. When people overeat, they don't feel like, ah, when someone that wants to, I don't know, smoke, goes and smoke. No, with food, it causes guilt. But when people feel guilty all the time because of their eating pattern, it starts being something that it's not being controlled by their mind and something that could lead to depression. Also, if people by their eating pattern start getting changes in the body composition that they don't want and they cannot control because they have a mind control they have these hormones asking for more and more and more food. These altered body composition for some people, it could lead to a way of depression because they're getting a result and a social result that they don't want. And it's completely understandable. It's completely respectable. For some people, gaining weight, it's an undesirable uh, consequence. And when you have an eating pattern that you don't control and it's, going to, it's causing an addiction, and that addiction is causing you to overeat and to go and have guilt, it could lead to depression, of course. And if you think that this information is useful, please remember, guys, before you leave, that the best way that you can support us, it's very easy. It's just to share the video with your contacts. Please remember also to hit the like button so the algorithm gets better so we can keep on building this community. We already got to the 100,000 followers, and we're very thankful for that, but we really want to be growing 
so we can share with you and we can grow this community for one reason, one purpose, to have more people knowing that we can be the owners of our health. And we can do that when we have the tools and we know how to apply them. Before you leave, please remember also to subscribe and hit the like button. So every time that we make new videos, you're gonna get a message and you're gonna be notified so you can see the video. Thank you guys, see you next time. Bye-bye, ciao. When you have insulin resistance, regard, regardless of the rest of the things that start happening, regardless though, apart from 